Okay, so we're starting chapter six in the book. The chapter is about initial value problems. Wow, I haven't used Zoom for a couple weeks and now I'm forgetting how to use it. There it is. We're using Microsoft Teams, which I don't prefer, but you get used to one thing or another, right? <laughs> Here it is. So I did this in a, in a uh, Jupyter notebook this time just to make my life easier. I'm going to try to translate it into a, um, uh, a markdown for the our markdown at the end so we can get it into the notes, but I'm not making any promises at this point. So the first part of this chapter just kind of is a review of what is an ODE. I don't know if you guys have taken classes in differential equations or not. If so, it'll be a review. If not, it's, it's somewhat new ideas. Uh, so some definitions, what is an ODE, what is an ordinary differential equation? It's basically just an equation that relates a function and its derivatives with respect to one variable, y prime, y double prime, and potentially higher derivatives. The highest order, the highest uh, derivative in the equation determines what's called the order of the ODE. And it turns out, as we'll see, that any a higher order differential equation can be turned into a system of first order differential equations. So we will only concentrate on first order at first, because again, when we come with the second order, we can just turn it into a first order system of equations. Um, one other thing, just if you don't know what, what makes it so ordinary, an ordinary differential equation is an equation like this, where the derivatives are with respect to one variable. Um, there's also partial differential equations where you have derivatives with respect to more than one variable, like time and space, for example, for the wave equation. I think that's like chapter 13. <laughs> yeah, thir chapter 13. So that's the last thing we'll do in this book. So if we get, if we get to that part, we'll be, we'll be golden, right? <laughs> uh, last definition is initial value problem. So these, this chapter is about initial value problems, which means that the problem is specified by the initial, by the equation and by the initial conditions for the equation. The, um, the, the, the other type of problem you'll encounter is a boundary value problem, which is chapter 10. Boundary value problem, instead of uh, specifying it just at the initial condition, you also can specify at the initial condition and the, the final condition. For that to make sense, you have to have a higher order equation, a first order equation only can have the initial condition, but a second order equation, you could have a, uh, a initial condition and like a final condition, like two ends of a string, for example, or something like that. Uh, and anyway, that'll come up in chapter 10. And I think I might've misspoke because really only I first order IVPs that can be, higher order IVPs that can be translated into a system of first order uh, differential equations. Higher order B boundary value problem, you can't necessarily do that. Okay, so the final thing here is what is the solution for uh, an IVP? Well, it's some function, instead of a value, it's going to be a function of time that satisfies both the equation and the initial condition. The book also mentions that there's a special case of linear differential equations, which have this special form. Um, where the derivative is equal to some function of t, the inhomogeneous term they call it, and then a function that is linear in u, u times some function of t. In that case, you can solve those equations uh, analytically, but uh, that's a really no use. It's almost no real interesting equations are gonna be linear and they've already been solved. And that's why there's so much interest in these numerical methods. Speaking of numerical methods, Julia has a nice package called differential equations. Julia, which is automatically loaded for you when you use the, I, I'm using the <clears throat> fundamentals numerical computation library. So all these things are automatically loaded in the background. But if you're not using that, you'll need to install and use directly import this differential equations package to use these features. So let's just demonstrate that with one of the exercises, this is exercise 6.17. And the problem is that um, evidence, this is about caffeine, about taking a cup of coffee. So supposedly a large mug of coffee has about 300 milligrams of caffeine. If it takes you a half an hour to consume it, and then how long is it, then what does the time dependence of your caffeine uh, level look like? 
And the other assumption for the model is that the, the total concentration will be about eight micrograms per milliliter, right? And that you get that spread out through that first half hour. And then they said, this is followed by a first order kinetics with a half-life about six hours. And you can write this as an equation, a differential equation like this. So this says that the uh, caffeine concentration decays with this time constant k. So that's what the minus kx means. So that means for any particular time, the rate of, there's going to be a rate of decrease k, right? Times how much your current uh, level is. And this C of T is a inhomogeneous term, which tells you how much uh, incoming caffeine there is, right? <laughs> that's what that term is supposed to mean. And in the model, they give us that the inhomogeneous term, the driving term here is that the ca caffeine concentration is 16 uh, from zero to half an hour and then zero afterwards. So 16 times a half is eight. That's the eight micrograms that, that you're going to consume uh, in the end. So our exercise here is to use the built-in solve method to solve this. Note this is a linear equation. It could be solved analytically, um, but we don't have to do that. So first we just have to program the step function and Julia, I, I just use this, um, the, ni the nice feature that when you multiply by a Boolean, it treats the Boolean as an integer. So that's easy enough to create a step function that way. And then to write an equation in uh, Julia, you write the F, the function F that's on the right-hand side of the equation as a function of three, stop, but that's the hover thing. Three arguments, the uh, U, which is the, solution you're trying to find p which is any extra parameters which in this case is k because they uh, we wanted to, they wanted to try two different things an eight hour half-life and a six hour half-life half life so i left that as a parameter and then finally t so you just write it as a function of those three things even if you don't have any parameters p you still have to provide that argument to make a differential equation problem properly we have an initial yeah. condition yeah can you zoom in a little bit is that possible uh yeah let me see, I think, appearance. Yeah, I guess I should know this, just control. Oh, I went the wrong way. That's better, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, that's else, good. So we don't need this terminal down here. Okay, is that better? Actually, I was having trouble reading it too. I'm just surprised I yeah, didn't make it bigger. <laughs> so the initial condition, um, you give it that, and then you have to specify a time span over which you want to solve the problem. We were told uh, 12 hours. So that's what we go from time zero to 12 hours. So initially, there's no caffeine in your system. It follows this differential equation that U prime equals minus PU plus C, and C is a step function. We've fully specified the problem. Just for uh, completeness, I just plot the C function. is just a step function. It's 16 uh, micrograms per, whatever the units are. What is this, hour? Yeah. 16 micrograms per hour, I guess. Uh, but we only do it for half an hour, so we get eight micrograms. Micrograms per, sorry, micrograms per milliliter per hour or something, I don't know. One should be careful about units, but I won't be. <laughs> so the next step is once you've got your function F, which is the right side of the equation, your initial condition, your time span, and any extra parameters you want, which in this case is this time constant log two over six, you define an ODE problem, which is a kind of object in Julia, differential equations library by just calling ODE problem with those four parameters. And that returns an object, an IVP six object, which is not, doesn't actually, hasn't done anything yet. You just said, this is how I specified the problem. And in this chapter, we're gonna use that same structure for our own solvers. So it's fine that we, it's good that we know how to make those. But the built-in solver needs those. And so you just pass that in, solve that problem. And you have to tell what method and the book uses this whatever this TSIT5 is, I have no idea. I should have looked that up. But it uses this, this is the recommended solver that they use, which is their most accurate one, which I don't think in this chapter we're gonna discuss how it's built. But I think it's an uh, adaptive, fully adaptive, high order method, right? Implicit probably. So I, anyway, make the two solutions and I can plot them. Uh, a plot is override overrided for these. So these uh, solution objects that come back are also objects of some kind. And plot has been overridden to know how to deal with those in, in Julia. So that it's part of the library to override the plot function. So it knows how to, you just say plot the solution. Okay, fine. And anything else here is just extra, right? 
graphics label it, whatever. Um, so I guess I decided what I do here. What happened? Did this not work? I have no idea why I wrote this and then wrote it again here, but whatever. Uh, maybe I should just evaluate it all. Find out what wrong. I'm just curious. I should be evaluating these things anyway, so you really believe they work. <laughs> and they are not slow. Okay, that's still slow. Oh yeah, I guess this this plot didn't actually work for some reason. Maybe it didn't like the pairs. So I did it this way, built it up. Plot one, then plot bang the other one on top of it. So, okay, there's a solution. Half an hour, you're, during the first half an hour, your concentration rises, uh, and then afterwards it decays and one's faster than the other. Okay, so what? Big. Beautiful. Uh, the next part of the chapter talks about the, this is now we get into the math part of the chapter. Um, each one of these chapters, you, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it seems like, oh, this is cool. This is like a numerical method. Okay, well, now we're going to talk about convergences and all this stuff. And you're like, oh, I know this is important, but okay, <laughs> hang on. Here we go. So first thing is there's a theorem that if this F function, remember that's the right-hand side of the OD, if it exists, I'm sorry, if the partial differential equation, the partial derivative of f with respect to u exists and is bounded in absolute value by a constant l over the span of the problem, then the IVP problem, as we've defined, it, has a unique solution and exists. So that's just an important condition you can check to make sure that you're not going to run into any trouble. Uh, there's an exercise that has you go through and look at, uh, I think I only looked at one of them. This is 6.1.1. Oh, I did 6.1.1 and 6.1.2 together, but only for one of the, the little parts. Because a lot of these problems have like, you know, 10 or so steps uh, that you could go through. Or 10, 10 or so like parts. This one doesn't have 10, it's got only four, but I just did one of them, number C. So the point is, uh, take a look at this problem. Actually, no, I did two of them. I'm sorry, <laughs> as you remember. Take a look at this problem and find the... Um, can I move this? Yeah. Take a look at this problem and, and, and determine the smallest value of L. Well, determine if it satisfies the conditions of the theorem and then determine the smallest value of L and then solve it. Um, well, I should say the bounded value of L, but anyway, solve using solve and plot it with initial condition of U of zero equals one. Okay. So if both of them I tried did not have any issues with. Um, I don't know. I actually looked at the other two, the four, the sub subset of four, but did, I didn't find any of them that looked like they were going to have a problem with this uniqueness. So I don't know. Maybe I missed something there. If you guys look at it, you can, when you're enjoying your week off, you can look through these and, and find out if there's any conditions that are not satisfied. But the first one, um, the function f is this thing. Um, calculate the partial derivative. It's this. And that's clearly not going to blow up over that interval. And since u, this is it's a minus sign here, and everything's squared, you know that u, whatever u starts with is just going to decay by just looking at it, right? The rate is negative, so u is always going to get smaller um, and not go and decay towards zero because u squared over here. It's not going to pass through. And that's where it's going to pass through and blow up in negative infinity. It's clear u is bounded by the initial condition, right? So uh, and the partial derivative is this, which is also going to be bounded by that initial condition and by the maximum that it gets, which is... Um, T at the end. So I claim that L, oh, I guess my got extra dollar sign there. L is bounded by 20 times whatever the initial condition is, which since it's one, um, it's bounded by 20. So the point is that the, the solution exists and it's unique. So just repeating the same exercise we did before, we can just put in, here I just took a shortcut and used an anonymous function to put in the, um, f function, remember it has to take u, p if there's any parameters, and t. Now here at p, I'm not using it, but I put it in there anyway because we need to have that third argument. I don't know if like in Python, you could put like an underscore there or something, if it's something you're not going to use. I'm not sure if there's a dummy placeholder you can use in Julia. I, or I say I'm not sure, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Any of in the book, they put a p there and they just don't use it. So I just put down the equation exactly like it is up there, put in the initial condition, put in the range, solve it, and plot it. And this just works just fine. There's no trouble, it doesn't blow up. Doesn't do anything funny, decays down towards zero, just like I uh, claimed. And the next one I thought, oh, this is gonna have some trouble because 
it's gonna you take the derivative of a square root, you know, you get one over the square root. That's gonna cause some issues. But in this case, again, because now in this case, u square root of u is positive, and u starts at one, we know that u is just gonna increase, right? So one over square root of u is also going to just decrease. So it's again gonna have its biggest value at the beginning, uh, at, when at the very beginning at t equals zero. So L in that case is one over two times the square root of U or one half in this case. So again, bounded and the solution should exist and be unique. And we can just again, put that in there. I won't belabor the point uh, and solve it. And like I thought it does just increase the out bound. Nothing particularly interesting about that solution. The next thing we always have to worry about in this book is conditioning. How badly does, do these problems blow up? And they give us this formula. They say, okay, again, if the partial derivative of f exists and it's bounded, then um, the solution, and he's only gonna talk about perturbing the initial condition, not perturbing in some other way, like coefficient or something, which is something you might worry about, of course, but in this book, he's gonna just talk about perturbing the initial condition. Then the solution, um, uh, the, the, what do you call it? The, um, the difference between the solution and the perturbed solution is the maximum, uh, the infinite, what do you call it? The uh, maximum difference is bounded by this, which for small delta, which is basically linear in delta, but it's exponential in this L constant, whatever that is. So we know L was kind of big numbers and these intervals can be big. This is kind of a very loose bound on the error, but at least we know it's only linear for in delta. So it's delta, whatever errors you make in the differential equation, the initial condition is not, um, going to be quadratic in delta or something like that, but, but it could be big. And he says, this is usually a terrible overestimate. Uh, and the text goes into this a little more detail. Often, sometimes, often solutions uh, can converge from different initial conditions, as you know, because it's got like an attractor. So the different solutions will come together, in that which case uh, changes in the initial conditions won't have much effect. But as you know, often changes in the initial condition have a very large effect, especially for nonlinear uh, equations and that's the whole field of chaos that was popular back when Jurassic Park the movie came out right <laughs> small changes in this can just can lead to huge changes in the, in the in the end result so I don't know whether that was valuable or not but that's he, he, he talks about that now we get into rolling our own numerical methods and the most obvious thing to do is okay I'm just going to take t and make a little grid of points march along right, uh, you know, divide, divide the time from A to B into N points of size H, which is what they call the time step. And, and you say, okay, well, I'll just approximate the derivative in the most obvious way by a, by a finite difference, right? The, the, the value at this time minus the value at this time divided by H. And if you just do that and plug it into that differential equation, you end up with this, where you just say, okay, U at the next time step is gonna be whatever it was times H, which is like delta t, like the time step times that function f. And that's what's called Euler's method. You may hear me call it Euler's method because I learned about it before I ever had to say it. But <laughs> it's, Euler's method is the correct pronunciation. I've made, been made to understand many times. The, um, and this is in some ways kind of like the obvious thing to do, right? If you, don't, if you didn't do anything at all, you're like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I often like to think about this as this is kind of what a differential equation in some sense to me means. It's like, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, in a limit, very h goes to zero, this, right? Because <laughs> what, you know, what I do is I have a value of u and I want to march it forward in time. This is how I march it forward. I just evaluate f, multiply by dt, add it to u and keep on marching all the way forward in time. These kind of methods are called one-step methods, um, one-step IVP methods, because they only rely on the previous value of u to calculate the next value of u. Later in this chapter, we will talk about methods that can use multiple uh, values of you going back further in time to try to get a better approximation, but not today. That'll be after the two week break. So the, this is, I just copied this code in cause I will need a code in from uh, the book that they did. And all they do is just in the most straightforward way, I suppose, um, define this Euler method as a, a function. And here's the key part right here. And you can see he's using the IVP thing, the OD problem uh, type, and you just have to know that you can get the T-span back out of that. It's basically just an object. So you get the T-span, you get F, and you can get the initial condition. 
out of it that way. And I don't want to, I don't need to belabor that at all. Does anyone have any questions at this point before we press on to local truncation errors? So the book defines this uh, concept of a local truncation error. So in the, and this is not just for Euler's method, but for any general one-step method, which can always be written like this, where the u at the next time step is equal to u the previous time step plus h, the time step size, times some function of phi. Now, in the Euler method, it's just f, but it could be something else in, in a more complicated method, like in the Rangakata methods we'll talk about shortly. The local truncation error is defined as, now u hat here is the true solution, the actual true solution of the initial value problem. And the truncation error is, well, how much, if, you, if I did that finite difference with the true solution, how much does that differ by what I'm claiming it is, which is phi here? That's called the truncation error. And a method is called consistent, another definition, if as this tau, uh, I'm sorry, if as h, the size of the time step goes to zero, uh, tau goes to zero, the truncation error goes to zero. And, and should be no surprise that for the Euler method, this is in fact the case. It's consistent in the first order in H, it turns out. So it's not fast, but it does converge. Speaking of that, converging, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say converge, it's consistent. Uh, so the convergence of a um, ODE, which, where we can really better care about the global error, right? Which is the, he defines as the vector of all the errors for all the time. So you'd plot, you take U, for all time, and then you take your approximation of u for all time, you, you take a look at the error between those two for all time, you end with a vector of errors. And the error is a function of time, right? Um, and he says often this is interpreted like you may want, only care about the maximum. How bad is it? How What's the worst it ever does? Uh, are, and often you, you only care about the final value because you're trying to predict something like, here's my initial value. I want to know what the weather's going to be like in two days. Calculate all my differential equations forward two days from now. I predict the temperature, how bad is the error then? I don't care how bad it was earlier. I only care about the final. And that could be what you call the global error, error in your interpretation. But he shows that no matter how you define it, um, the global error is order of h to the p power, where p is the same exponent that we would find in the uh, local truncation error. And in this case, is one for the uh, Euler method. So for Euler, Euler methods, the error is linear in time step. So whatever the error is, you can reduce it linearly by taking your time step and cutting it in half. So uh, just to demonstrate that, uh, I'll look at another exercise, 6.2.2. Now, in this exercise, they give us a bunch of differential equations and their exact solution. Not necessarily linear equations, but some nonlinear equations also have exact. So this, is, this one I use right here, logistic equation, is known to have an exact solution, but it's not linear. OK. Um, you plot the, so we're going to use the Euler method, plot it for n equals 320, and then compute the error at the final time for various n's, n equals 10 times 2 to the k, for k equals 2, 3, blah, 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 10, right? And then we're going to make a look, look at the log log error at the final time. So first, I just didn't make this easy, because I was going to do like more than just two of these. So I said, oh, I should write a little function, don't repeat yourself, but in the end, I didn't really do more than two of them. So I just defined a quick little function to fit and plot the um, the uh, solution and the Euler solution. So I defined the problem the usual way, call that Euler function we defined before, plot the um, function, plot the solution, also plot the true solution. Which in here, I just pass it in. So here's an example calling that for problem D. Uh, where u prime equals 2u times 1 minus u, which has a known solution of, uh, for that initial condition of 1 over 1 plus e to the minus 2t. And we can run that, and you can't really see the difference. For n equals 320, apparently it's good enough for this that you can't, at this scale anyway, you can't see the difference um, between them. I suppose we plot the difference, you'd see there'd be a difference. But um, And then the other problem I looked at was uh, g. Uh, which is u prime equals 2, 1 plus t to, times 1 plus u squared, another nonlinear problem, but it has a solution in terms of tangents. And you can plot that. Oops, got ahead of myself there. And there you can see a little bit of difference at the end, even with n equals 320 uh, with your naked, with your eye. 
Um, and so we really want to look at the error in that final time. So I define another function just to do that. I won't go into details, um, just to calculate the truth, just simply take the calculate again, the because uh, I'm changing n, calculate again the, the Euler solution and then the true, and then compare the true solution at the end. Um, I don't know if it's worth going through all this Julia code. I don't think it is. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you want me to go slower through any of this, let me know. But this is pretty straightforward. I'm just defining a, uh, the ends and then stop the hovering uh, with ends and then just applying it with a list comprehension, uh, this error at the final time function to produce my errors. And then I'm just going to plot them. That's basically it. Hopefully it still works. I haven't forgotten something. Yeah, so it does work. So because oh, the dotted line here is what one over n looks like, scaled to fit in there, right? And uh, so this shows that both of these, the error is linear as we expected, right? The, the error, is, what is this saying? This is saying the, the final value of global error, but this is just saying the error, right, at the end. How bad was my Euler solution compared to the true solution as a function of n? You can see it is decreasing linearly. As I subdivide, more, the interval is finer and finer, I get a better solution, but go slow, only as order n. That's Euler's not the first order, so that's not a surprise. I'm going to do that time. Good. Okay, so that's the first order, uh, just first order equations. I mentioned before that um, we were interested perhaps in higher order equations, and then you can turn those into a system, but I didn't really say what the heck does mean by a system uh, initial value problems. That's what this definition is. This is it's just basically the vector form of the thing we already looked at. Now, instead of you being a single number, it's a vector. It's a list of, of a vector of numbers, right? And we're just saying that u prime element by element is equal to some function of t and u. And again, otherwise it's the same. There's a time span and then there's an initial vector instead of an initial condition. And it turns out because of the way Julia works, that Euler function we define without even thinking, having this in mind, automatically just works for, for this. Actually, because it'll just it'll take a vector, know what to do automatically, so to speak. Um, so it's pretty straightforward against what he's saying to you to do a system when you know how to do a single uh, equation. The next aspect was I mentioned about the higher order ODE. So this just shows you how you do that. For any higher order ODE, you can just convert it by introducing new variables that represent each of the derivatives of the higher order, right? So for the second order equation like this, where u double prime, the second derivative of u is equal to some function of t, u, and u prime, you just introduce a new variable, call it v. I think I'm thinking of velocity, right? Because right, that's the, the, the rate of u. So v, and then you just have a new equation. Uh, well, you have two equations now. v equals u prime, that's, that's a new equation. Even though I just said, I defined it, but now that is now a differential equation for v. And the other equation is v prime is equal to f. It's just, and then now we put v in there. So now it's, everything's first order. And that just shows you can convert any higher order initial value problem into a first order one. The uh, a quick exercise here is just to show an example of a system of differential, uh, yeah, system differential equations is a disease model. Uh, this is a disease that, uh, uh, let's see, in this, this equation we have, uh, Let's see, I was modeled by tracking the fraction of the population susceptible to the infection, that's V, that's our susceptible fraction. And there's another fraction that's infectious, W of T. And then the rest of the population is considered to be recovered and immune to the thing, right? They're not always, they don't stay immune, but they're at least temporarily immune. Uh, so this is a SIR model, it's a standard disease model, susceptible infectious recovered model. And he they just give us this equation here, but, um, you can say, okay, this says that the uh, the rate of people becoming susceptible, right, is has two parts. This is the 0 0.2 times one minus V is the people that aren't infected slowly, uh, you know, I'm sorry, the people that aren't um, susceptible, right, are gonna become susceptible at this rate, 0 0.2, right? And this part is, this pr product here represents the people that are, infectious meeting the people that are um, susceptible and getting infected at some, uh, at some rate. So this minus three VV represents that process. So the more uh, infected people are, then the more susceptible people are gonna get infected and 
both and vice versa. So that's why there's a product there. And you know, the same thing uh, is over here on the other side as well as a positive sense, because that's they flow from being susceptible to being infectious. And then there's this recovery rate minus one times a W. So that's the model. Um, I probably spent too much time trying to talk through that, but simple enough to put into a vector equation. So in the same way we wrote these things before, now U is a vector uh, and now uh, F is a vector. So we have to write both equations as, as the two elements of the vector here on the right-hand side. Uh, otherwise everything else is the same, but we have to initial conditions now a vector as well. So we got to put a vector in there for the initial condition. But the same way we define ODE problem as we did before, but now there's just vectors. And you can just, otherwise everything's really the same. You can just solve it. Um, here's where I run into this problem. Is, oh no, I guess not. And uh, yeah, what did I do here? Why did I plot this twice? Oh, right. Yeah, I ran into some interesting issue with this and that this VARS thing that he uses in the book is not actually anywhere in the Julia document. Somehow it just got deprecated away and it's been changed to IDXs uh, instead. So that's just something to be aware of. Because um, if you want to plot like a, uh, and it's weird too, because if you put a list like this, you get the two things. You actually you don't actually even need this because there's only two things I think in this particular case. Yeah, you don't need it in that case because there's only two elements. You get you just plot the solution. You'll get the, the here's the um, initially, you know, no, you know, only a very small, what is it? 5% of people initially, yeah, 5% of people are initially infected and 90, the rest are, are, are susceptible at this point. No, nobody's immune. And then over time, people get infected and there's a little oscillation. It's kind of interesting that happens uh, before everything kind of reaches steady state at the end. So by about, well, maybe by, by T equals 20, it reaches steady state. It's a steady state because there's people that are, that become uh, recovered are not immune forever. They, the way the equation is written, they come back uh, to be susceptible after their immunity wears off. And then it just all balances out for, over a period of time. In fact, you could solve that, right? You just solve this, you solve for F, um, you solve for dv dt equals zero, and the, uh, this, uh, the vector equation, you solve the dv dt equals zero, dw equals zero as a system of equations, right? So you can find that um, equilibrium that way. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out about plotting, this is another little Julia strangeness, is if instead of giving it a list, uh, well, I took it away, but instead of giving it a list, you give it a tuple, it does something different. <laughs> uh, and sometimes this is what you want. So this kind of is this now, uh, it says V of T, but it's really V versus uh, W, a plot, uh, X, Y plot. So it interprets it different if it's a tuple versus a, a square brackets. And that threw me off when I first did this. I wanted this and I got this, this spirally thing instead. I'm like, what's going on? I don't know why I repeated this here. Anyway, that's. Uh, I also had a uh, learned a behavior on accident from putting a comma between the labels, <laughs> and it, then it just used the whole. Oh yeah. It used every. It just repeated that label twice. Yeah, because it's a it has a different meaning, right? Yeah. Yeah. It just puts the whole thing in. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, I'm not sure what's going on there. I started, like I said, I started looking, working through this book called Julia. It's a second language. And right now I'm in the middle of this thing about how the, the type system works. It's pretty interesting, but not doesn't I've, I've not really learned much more than I've learned from the book. So this book so far. Uh, hmm. Let's see. Wait, why did I run out here? Did I do more of this? Did I not? Did I do it on a different computer? Sorry, I think I might have not resynced this thing. I apologize. One second, please. I would like to get at least a little bit further in the beginning. Yeah, that's what happened. During this intermission, you can see my dogs. Oh, cute. <laughs> cute. The black one, she's only four months old and she's crazy. All right now, puppy.
What is the color? Okay. You gotta try and do some. Oh, in the wrong window, that's why. Okay, never mind. Okay. I was synchronizing the wrong project. All right, so I have to reevaluate re things here for some partial things here. Where did that that to find it. Okay, any questions up to this point before we go to the Runge Kada? Am I saying that right? Anybody know? I think I am. Ron, there's a, so in exercise 6.1.4, I think the one with squared of u. Yeah. Uh, I think the, it doesn't satisfy the conditions of the theorem as, as far as I could see. Although there's a solution, it seems, because you, because the partial derivative is undefined at uh, zero, I think. I think you have that example as an exercise. It's still undefined at zero, but u is never zero. But I, I think it's, it is, oh, sorry, let me see. That's what, I think that's meant to throw you off because t is zero, you're like, oh, yes, there's a problem, but u is never zero, so it never actually touches that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because u starts out at one and just increases after that, it never gets near zero. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, me, I guess that's it. I think that was the point of that one. It's like, so you'd be, ah, wait a minute. T, T is zero, and you get those. You know, I, I know I got confused by it at the first. So, that's yeah. Stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, this section is about um, higher order methods, methods that converge faster. And these methods are called Runge-Kutta methods. Forgive my pronunciation if that's incorrect. They boost evaluate. They boost the order of accuracy by evaluating f more times. They're still single step methods, but they evaluate f at more, uh, more, more times in between. Basically, more times not mean necessarily more times t, but more, more evaluations. And these are, as they say, some of the most widely used methods for solving ODEs. But I don't think that's what t set is. But anyway, I digress. So he starts with to give you the idea of how this works by looking at how you could improve the Euler method. And kind of like how we did before, we look at the Taylor series um, for, uh, for an exact solution. When I say did before, I mean like before we use Taylor series to do this. So here we're gonna use Taylor series to look at this as well. What we're gonna do is look at a Taylor series for the exact solution of U, whatever that is. We don't know the exact solution, but if we did, we could do a Taylor series expansion, right? Uh, in, uh, in, or in H, right, the difference between T plus I and T. And that's what this represents. So U at T uh, sub I plus one is equal to U at the previous time times to first order H times U prime, the real U prime, to second order H squared over two times U double prime, the real one, and then on and on and on, right? And so, okay, let's substitute in, well, we know U prime is F, so that's the differential equation. And we know U double prime is F with respect to T. Uh, times, uh, and then also remember that F depends on U and T, so you can use a chain rule here. So it's partial of F respect to T plus the partial of F respect to U times U prime, and again, at U prime's F. So that's how this expression comes about. It's it's in the book. Um, so you substitute that in. Okay, that doesn't really get us anywhere right away. But then they make the observation that if we take F and we perturb it in T and in U, in the right way, we can get it to match this term that's in brackets up here. And that's the trick that they use here. So that instead of instead of figuring out um, numerically partial distance, well, instead of evaluating the true partial differential, uh, partial derivatives of F here, we're gonna use this approximate, we're gonna use this to approximate that. And because it's also over H cubed, it's no problem, right? As long as you're gonna stick to the second order. And if you do this uh, and match the terms, you end up with this improved Euler method, where now, for, it's again, it's a still a single step, but now for this step, we're gonna evaluate F at a different point. Where instead of evaluating it at the initial time, we're gonna evaluate halfway uh, uh, initial time, right? Halfway between 
the previous time in the, in the current time. And we're going to evaluate it not at the previous value, but the previous value half propagated, if you will, right? So we're going to take the previous value and then propagate it for half a time step using Euler, the ordinary Euler method, right? So this is a way to improve the method by using a, a better value of f that is more representative for that what, what, what f was like during that time step. You see what I'm saying? Because um, f changes from u sub i to u sub i plus one. What we were using is just the initial value of f at the beginning. But by the time we get to u sub i plus one, f is different. So here we're going to use some intermediate value in some sense. And this is called a multi-stage method. This is improved Euler, but it's also a kind of Runge Kutta method, even though it only uses one F, it just uses a thicker one. And you can think of it though as being a multi-stage. I'm sorry, it does use two valuations of F. It uses this valuation of F at the initial time and then another valuation at the halfway time. Okay, so it does use two evaluations. And that's made more explicit if you rewrite that this way, you define K1 is equal to H times F. That's how much the, that's the Euler propagation step. Then K2, another Euler-like propagation, but now evaluated at F at this midpoint and using the previous K to propagate you forward halfway, if you will. Not truly halfway, but you get what I'm saying. Give it a half a boost, right? And then finally, we uh, update you based on K2. Now, writing it this way makes it a little more clear, as we'll see, that this is similar to the other Rangikata methods. So we can write that as a function. I'm going to skip through that. Um, it's in the book, but I just need, I need it. That's why it's in here. <laughs> I need it. Um, so the book goes through, uh, it talks about how you can generalize that to more stages and uh, lots of examples. I'm just going to focus on this uh, and not even tell you how to derive it because the book doesn't either, but there is this, um, uh, and I can't derive it, but <laughs> there is this fourth order method. Well, in a sense, how you derive it is the same way. You just go to the next order in the Taylor series, you match up terms and you know you come up with this. But that can't be quite right because he gives, there's other examples that are also fourth order. And same thing with the Euler, there's other methods, there's other ways of arranging the coefficients you kind of get the same results. So I've never, I didn't really understand that that was anyone else capture that? Like how could it be that there'd be more than one thing? But I, I don't know for sure, but I thought it was something similar to when we talked about like forward and backward and center uh, differencing. That could be. Because he writes out these things in the in the little matrix formulation in the book. Um, and he says, oh, here's another method. Here's another method. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> in any event, this is the most commonly used method. And it's four, it's got four valuations of F at different points in time. First at the initial time, at this um, kind of place we did with the improved Euler, right? But then doing it again, um, using that kind of doing the approved earlier again, and then finally putting it all together uh, into an update. And these, all these coefficients are, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you just have to remember because there's no way you're gonna, I'm gonna sit down and derive that anytime I need it. Uh, and the text makes the point that this fourth order method is kind of, a, in terms of these fixed time step methods, not adaptive um, and single step methods, this is a sweet spot in efficiency and accurate versus accuracy. If you add more, orders it uh, it takes longer and doesn't improve the accuracy uh, as much as so diminishing returns at that point is what they claim and, uh, so again they implement this in the book so you can see how it would be written in code and just as an example um this is how you might write the simple harmonic oscillator like a bass on a spring uh in a very straightforward way Again, uh, the function f is, um, uh, so in this equation, v or uh, u2, or so, so u1 is like the velocity, so u velocity is equal to u2, which is the position, uh, derivative of the position, and the position u2 is equal to minus uh, the velocity. And if you think that through, you'll see that that'll make an oscillator because as it, as you, as it gets away from the origin, it wants to restore back, right? And so I just define that problem and I plot it. And the reason why I chose this, because you know, if you know uh, the simple harmonic oscillator, you know that it just oscillates at a constant amplitude forever. And if I use Euler method, even with the 4,000 points, we see there's a problem. It starts to diverge over time. 
And not, any, a lot of these closed uh, problems like that, like if you did like an orbit of a planet around a, or moon around a planet, you'd see the same thing. And if you just use the Euler method, it would eventually just the planet, the moon would break loose from the planet and disappear. And, and the nice thing is that if you use the um, improved Euler already, It's, it's stable, at least to this point in time. Because it's a higher order method, basically, is why. Uh, let's see. Uh, another example is he gives is the, um, this, oh, so another thing he wants to do is go back to the SIR model we already did, but now use the RK core with it. So, I mean, there's not much to say about that. I mean, I, you can do that, okay, fine. Um, oh, but we might want to compare it to um, the Euler solution, right? And you can see that there is a difference. So the, the, the our, our RK4 method is, you know, but they're both fairly accurate. The differences here are small for this particular problem. Uh, let's see, the next problem I looked at, uh, maybe I'll come back to that if we, I'm gonna forget how much I wanted to try to cover it here. I want to finish this section. Oh, okay, that's it. Okay, good. So, so I'll make sure. So, in this, oh, this has to do with the, so what we want to do, we talked about this being fourth order. It should converge to fourth order. Let's show that. So we'll take I chose uh, 6.49. I chose chose problem D arbitrarily. Uh, this is a linear differential equation, uh, second order, right? Um, and it's so it's got a known solution, which they give us. So before we can solve this, we have to turn to a system. So we use the, the recipe to turn to a system of different equations. So it's first order again. Um, and then we can just define it in the way we've done before. Nothing new here. Use the RK, RV, RK4 function we defined above. And then we can plot um, the solution to this equation. And I also plot the true solution. You can't, at this level, I've done 300 points. You can't see any difference by I, um, but we're going to look at the terminal error in this thing. What is this? I forget what I did that for. Um, I guess that's the, that's the answer. Um, that's this, what, um, oh, I was just trying to figure out how I can get that, <laughs> get the last, I was trying to figure out how to do the subscripting, right? That was what that was for, to make sure I get that final value out. So I want the second element, which is the U, the proper U. I don't care about the other variable I introduced. It's not really part of this, the solution, right? It's a second order equation. And I want the last one. And even then, I, did, I only want the, I get, no, I, I forget what now I remember what the, all this was all about. Why there's two here. I'm just curious. Hang on a This is why I had to, to do that. What's, what's, what's one? I don't know. I don't know. Let me just see, I'm just curious. Was this the vector of vectors thing they were talking about? I think so. Yeah, I had some issues with the vector of vector things during this, doing this stuff. But um, anyway, I this recipe worked to get the final value out, so I was happy with that. Um, so I count, so I solved the problem using RK four, RK four extract out the final value of U and compare it to the true solution at four as well. Um, and then we're doing this for a different and again. This is the same thing we did before uh, with the. Euler method, but now using the Runge Kutta method. And we can put a line in here for, oh, it's not labeled correctly. You can put a line in here that shows, yeah, it's converging to the fourth order in N, which is much, much faster than the Euler method. So every time you decrease the time step by two, you're getting, you know, to the four improvement in your solution, in your global error. So that any questions about that? I think that takes me to the end of the section. How far I wanted to cover this time. Next time will be adaptive Runge-Kutta and the multi-step methods and the other parts. So hopefully they aren't too long. We can get through it, but 
I really I haven't actually read the last two sections about stability and all that. Zero stability, but that's the plan to get to uh, when we finish our break. Yeah, great. I don't uh, have any questions. I think that's as much also as I un got out of it. <laughs> it's a lot to take. These cha these chapters are are dense. Yeah. Opinion. But it's uh, helping me a lot. I'm starting a new project on with an engineer and collaborator on dynamic oh. equations. So <laughs> it's uh, well, then you'll know, like, hey, which integrator should we use? Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you just a little drop down menu and some of these tools that, yeah, yeah. I mean, usually you use you want to use something like the Runge cut or probably more like one of these more advanced ones we're going to get to. Mm -hmm. There's weird a situation where you, we have to use like an Euler method. For example, if you have stochastic elements in there or you have discrete events happening, then you have to be mm -hmm. a little more careful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll type the end then. I think that's in the, this section. But just as a reminder, anybody watching, and to us, we're not here next week, and we will be back.